Hey there, Adrian Rosebrock here from PyImageSearch.com, and today we'll be discussing convolution and cross-correlation and the role they play in convolutional neural networks. So before we get too far in this tutorial, I want to go back to PyImageSearch University and point out that you really should have gone through OpenCV 102 and more specifically the kernels lesson here. Go through the video tutorial, read the source code, maybe even test yourself with a quiz we have up here. And the reason I say this is because convolution and kernels we've already discussed here in OpenCV 102. What we're going to do here today with convolution and cross correlation is take what we've learned about image kernels and convolution and apply that to the convolutional neural networks. So I really, really suggest go through this lesson first. You don't need to go through the rest of the lessons in OpenCV 102, but just going through kernels by themselves, I really think that's a prerequisite. I really think that's a requirement to what we're going to be covering here today. So if you haven't gone through the kernels lesson, pause this video, go watch that kernels video. It'll give you a deeper understanding and a better appreciation for what we'll be doing. So with that said, if you're still with me now, I'm going to assume you've going through the kernels lesson, you understand the fundamentals. And now we're going to switch over to convolution and the role they play in neural networks. So what exactly is the role of convolution in neural networks? Like we've learned about convolution. We learned about image filters. We learned that we can hand define kernels to do things like blurring. We could do things like gradient computation, edge detection. You know, but the problem there is that all of those kernels are hand defined. A computer vision researcher or a practitioner had to sit there and work out the mathematics to ensure they understood how this kernel worked and how that, when it was convolved with an input image, we would obtain a particular result. That's all fine and good from an image processing perspective. But now we need to start to think in terms of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning. When applying machine learning, these handcrafted filters only get us so far. There's only so much we can learn. There's only so many patterns we can learn. A better approach would be if we could automatically learn these filters, learn these filters that our brains wouldn't necessarily even comprehend or even be possible of manually constructing. And if we do that correctly, then we can learn this hierarchy of features. And this is something that I discuss up here in the introduction to this tutorial. Convolutional neural networks and neural networks in general are compositions, they're hierarchies. They build on each subsequent layer. So in our, we start with our original input image and the first few layers of that network, maybe, maybe we're doing things like learning edges or maybe even corners from the original input image. And then from there, we have our, our mid layer convolutional layers. And that's maybe where you're learning edges or shape like objects. And then finally, in the higher level layers of the network, maybe that's when you're starting to learn these more abstract con concepts like facial structures or parts of a vehicle and, and what have you. So the point here is that the output from one layer feeds into the next and feeds into the next and feeds into the next. So these filters, they're, they're composed, they're, they stack on each other. It is a hierarchy. So the goal of machine learning and deep learning in this context is that we want to automatically learn these filters for ourselves. But before we get to that point, we really need to understand convolution. And I love to describe that in terms of this big matrix and tiny matrix analogy. So here in the background, we have this matrix here. This region is our input image. And then we have this kernel right here expressed by this red rectangle. And this kernel is gonna slide from left to right, top to bottom, one pixel at a time. And each stop along the way, it's going to take the values of the input image and the values of our kernel. It's gonna do an element-wise multiplication, and it's gonna perform a sum, and it's gonna store that output value in our output matrix. And again, all of that is covered here in this kernels lesson. So seriously, that kernels lesson is a prerequisite to what we're going to be doing here today. So what I want us to focus on is doing the hand computation of kernels ourselves. I want us to focus on learning that because what you learn here, well, that's going to help help you appreciate and understand what machine learning and, and deep learning is doing. It is actually learning these filters automatically through the process of backpropagation by comparing the output of the network to what the ground truth, to what the target label or target value should be, then updating the weights of the network. So let's take a look at our project directory structure. We have convolutions.py. This is where we're going to hand implement convolution by hand. 
and then we're going to apply convolution to this input image right here. So again, today isn't meant to be focused on constructing your neural network to actually automatically learn those filters. That is going to come in our, our next course. Right now we're getting our feet wet. And much of the code we're gonna review here today is also covered here in the kernels lesson, but I'm also gonna take a little bit of a twist to it. I'm gonna focus on at a higher level overview how these neural networks actually learn those filters. So let's open up PyCharm here, and I have this convolutions.py file. And we start off with our imports. We have this rescale intensity function, which we'll use to scale the outputs of our convolution operation from whatever the input range is to the output range zero to 255. When we perform convolution, the first thing we're going to do is convert our output data type to a floating point data type, because due to the element wise multiplication, we could end up with negative values. And furthermore, these negative values could exist outside the range zero to 255. So that's why we perform this floating point operation first. And then once we're done performing all those operations, then we'll convert it back to an unsigned 8-bit integer in the range zero to 255. The rescale intensity function just makes all of that process very, very simple and straightforward. We have NumPy for numerical array operations, argparse for our command line arguments, and then CV2 for our OpenCV bindings. Now let's define this convolve function. This is responsible for actually performing the image convolution. And we pass in both our input image and K, the filter that we're going to apply with convolution. So we grab the spatial dimensions, meaning the width and height of both the input image and the kernel right here. And then we allocate memory for our output image, taking care to pad, pad the dimensions of the input image such that the spatial size of the input image matches the spatial size of the output volume. We're going to discuss zero padding and the role it plays in convolutional neural networks in the next lesson in this course. But basically, if you've gone through this kernels lesson here, then you know by definition, by applying convolution, we're going to reduce the spatial dimensions of our input volume or our input image. Well, applying zero padding, that is a really, really, or either zero padding or replicate padding, that is a simple, simple way to pad the dimensions of the output image such that the spatial dimensions match the input and the output. Here we're doing border replicate padding. So meaning any the pixel values along the borders of the image, we can pad them an arbitrary amount just keeping that same value and extending that value out a set number of pixels. So that's what we're doing right here via this copy make border function. Now we allocate memory for our output output image right here. The output image is gonna be the same dimensions, the same width and height as our input dimensions. Next, we need to perform convolution by sliding the kernel across each XY coordinate of the input image from left to right and top to bottom. So that's what these two loops here are doing. They're sliding the kernel from left to right and top to bottom. At each stop along the way, we're going to extract the region of interest from the input image. We'll perform the actual convolution by taking our element wise multiplication and summing that value together. And the output of the convolution operation will be stored in our output image right there. So in essence, this loop accomplishes convolution or, or cross correlation. Very, very simple to implement. And I hope you can easily understand this code, especially after going through our kernels lesson where we've already reviewed it before. From there, we rescale the output intensities of the image from whatever the current range is to be zero to 255 in the output. We then cast them back as an unsigned 8-bit integer so that we can easily display them to our screen using OpenCV. Then we return the output image here. So now let's learn how to apply this convolution operation. We start off by parsing our command line arguments. We need a single argument here, image, which is the path to our input image. And then next, let's start building some of these kernels. These are hand-defined kernels. This is a blurring operation with a 7x7 kernel, a larger blurring operation using a 21x21 21 uh, kernel. We have a sharpening operation to reveal more detail we have this Laplacian along with our Sobel kernels, which can be used to re reveal gradient information. And we have this emboss kernel. So with all these taken together, we build this kernel bank, which is just a list of two tuples. One, the first entry being our human readable name of the kernel, as well as the kernel itself. I want to really point out these kernels to you, especially these, because this is where you kind of appreciate the effort that some deep learning practitioners and researchers put together from a mathematical perspective to figure out what these values of the kernels should be. Notice these are all three by three kernels and we've hard coded 
their values too. Like the first row is zero, negative one, zero. Second row is negative one, five, negative one. The final row is zero, negative one, zero. These are hard coded. Hmm. Now, what does that have to do with deep learning? Well, these kernels were hand defined to perform some sort of operation like gradient computation and, and edge detection. But in deep learning, maybe those kernel values aren't optimal to the end task. And maybe we need, say, a five by five kernel at some place, or maybe a seven by seven kernel in another place. Well, how do you extrapolate this kernel to be five by five or seven by seven? And how do you know that you should use a sharpened kernel in a neural network? Or how do you know you should be using an embossed kernel or a, or a blurring kernel such as such as this one? Simple fact is that you don't you don't know that you don't know where those kernels should be should be placed. Instead, what you rely on is your abundance of data feeding into the neural network, and you're relying on backpropagation, comparing the output of the network as well as the ground truth label or the ground truth value, and then backpropagating those gradients through the network and updating the weights. So in essence, when you're performing deep learning, you have this concept of a list of, of filters in each convolution operation. But the difference here is that we hand-defined this list of kernels called a kernel bank. In a convolutional neural network, you're not hand defining those kernels. The convolutional neural network is learning them on your behalf. So in a way, you can kind of think of it as less work. It may seem like, oh man, it's complicated. I got to pre-process my data and I got to format it correctly such that the neural network can be trained. Actually, no. Compared to hand defining all these kernels, imagine that your neural network had a thousand different filters in it, which is actually a small number of convolution operations. And you were responsible for hand defining each of them such that you obtained high accuracy. In all likelihood, that's not possible and you will never achieve that result. But by actually training, training our network to automatically learn these filters, that is where the true power of CNNs lies. It takes all this hand defining and guesswork out of the way. It uses gradient descent and backpropagation to learn those filter values that makes our lives so much easier. But in essence, that convolution operation, this function we defined here, it's still the same concept of accepting an input image or an input volume, accepting an input filter K, and then applying this convolution operation. The exact same concept except that this filter K, that's automatically learned for us. So let's continue on with this example. We load our input image from disk here, we convert it to grayscale, and we loop over each of our kernels, and then we'll obtain the output using our convolve function, and then we'll obtain the output using the cv2.filter2d function. This is essentially the same as our convolve function, and we do this because we want to compare our custom function implementation with the OpenCV implementation and make sure they match up. And from there, we'll show our output images together. So if I run this script, you'll see the output of running our convolution operations. We have our input image on the left right here. We have the blurring operation using our convolve function and the blurring operation using OpenCV's function. These two outputs are the same. And as you can see, the input has been blurred. Now we can do the same thing now with a larger blur. Notice the outputs here are the same and our image is certainly more blurred. We can do this for a sharpening operation, showing more detail in the two images. We can compute the Laplacian, which will give us a bit of gradient information. We can do that also for the Sobel operators along the x-axis and along the y-axis as well. And then finally, we have this output here from an emboss operation. The key takeaway here is that these filters, these filters are learned for us in deep learning and convolutional neural networks. We don't have to define them. And if you understand that concept, as well as what we've discussed here in kernels and how convolution and kernels actually work, then you're ready to move on to the next steps. You're ready to learn about different layer types and convolutional neural networks and how you can conceptualize them as Lego pieces of how they fit together to build the output to this particular puzzle. It's not that hard. And as long as you understand that we're learning these filters using deep learning, then you're ready for the next steps. 
So make sure you go through this kernels lesson, absolutely required reading before we start discussing convolutional neural networks and the types of layers. And then make sure you know you read the text version of this article as well. I'll go into a bit more detail. As long as you understand that, you have all the prerequisites you need to be ready to start studying convolutional neural networks. So in our next tutorial, I'll start walking you through the layer types in CNNs, and you have a really, really strong foundation and be ready to start implementing your first convolutional neural network. See you then.